Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming along. Um, my name is Shane Lin. Um, I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company here in Dublin called EdgeTier. Uh, my talk title today is Data Visualization in Python, uh, Quick and Easy Routes to Plotting Magic, which was an ambitious title when I wrote it. Um, so as I wrote this talk, I realized a lot of code in the slides. Um, I'm kind of comparing a few different libraries. I'm going to try and keep it as light as possible. Um, the contents of today's talk, uh, and it was hard to kind of judge the level here, uh, is starting off with some data visualization basics, uh, looking at how you do this in Python, so how you get set up in Python, how you achieve visualization of data in Python, what libraries you need to know about to do that, and how you would start off. A few examples and comparisons of the different libraries that are out there and why you would use one over the other. And then some final notes of what to avoid at the end. Um, the intention of this talk is not to teach people, you know, you're not going to leave here saying, now I know how to visualize data. But hopefully you will know, I now know what to Google to visualize data. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you'll have keywords, you'll see words in blogs out there, you'll know roughly what they mean. Um, there's probably a wide range in the room. This talk is probably ideally suited to someone who's you know, interested in data science, maybe has come across a Jupyter notebook here and there, has dug in, wants to start moving into more advanced visualizations, and has a, a task where they're exploring data in their actual jobs. Um, if you're already doing that at length, I would advise you're going to be kind of bored. Um, so a little bit about ourselves first and why I'm talking about this. So my background is um, in research originally, so a PhD in um, engineering and computer science. Uh, I worked as an analytics consultant in Deloitte for some time, delivering kind of analytics projects into companies that had data problems. And then we set up our own company, um, originally in the telco space, but now in the, in the area of um, customer service. So we deliver artificial intelligence and machine learning products to customer contact centers. So we have an AI system that sits beside contact centers, contact center agents, and helps them to process through queries more efficiently. The reason we use data visualization in this job is part of kind of our sales process. So as a real world example, when we take on a new client, we will ask them for a dump of their data from their contact center. They will give us maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands of interaction records for emails, chats, calls, agents, performance for say the last year of how their customer contact center has worked. And then it's our task to sift through that data and work out what value can we deliver where are there efficiencies to be gained in the contact center, and what can we do about them? And the data visualization task for us is a really core part of that. Um, we do a lot of it in Python. I suppose I used to work a lot in R, so I have a lot of comparisons to that. Um, and we do a lot of it in Jupyter Notebooks on Amazon uh, Web Services. So we'll start right at the start. So what is data visualization? So data visualization is as here, it's any effort to help people understand what's happening in data through a visual context. Okay? So I can show you data in a spreadsheet. It will be numbers. And yes, you can look at them, and you could discern the patterns in that data. But if I show you a visualization of that data, you will definitely pick the point that I'm trying to make up a lot faster. Okay? The choice of the data visualization tool that you're using is of paramount importance in any analysis work that you do. Okay? In, in my kind of theory, I suppose here, is that what you want to do is you want to reduce the complexity between data to idea to creating a graph that tells you the answer. So if someone gives you a data set and you load it into your favorite tool, okay, and you're like, oh, I'd like to see a bar chart of how many agents answered how many chats. If you have to Google how to make that chart, then you're already out of the, your, your concentration has moved from the task at hand, which is answering questions about the data, to finding out how to make your plot. Okay? So where you want to get to in all of this work is getting to a point where the movement between raw data to visualization, and that visualization then spurs another idea as you explore through the data, back to let's make another graph. That interchange over and back is a massively iterative process in the data exploration task. And you need to have a tool set in your kind of arsenal that allows you to work effectively through that. So very rapidly, making new graphs, coming up with new ideas, make a different graph, filter the data, make another graph. Very interactive programming. So with that, iteration speed is important. Unintrusive is what I'm talking about there. It's not getting into your, it's not 
affecting the interface between you and answering questions, flexible enough to produce the graphs that you need to produce, and aesthetically pleasing. So there's no point having, well, there's a point having a really ugly graph that answers the question, but when you actually report on that or go back to the client, if you're presenting ugly graphs, they will think you're crap, um, even though you might not be. Uh, so there's a range of tools available out there. The first thing you're going to need to know is chart choice. As a tongue twister, uh, when you have data and you have a question, whether you're comparing one value, comparing two values, comparing three values, if they're continuous, if they're discrete, if they're different uh, kind of distributions, how are you going to display the data to answer your question? Loads of tools out there for what to choose. Um, in this presentation and in almost every report that I write, I would say there are four key graphs that you need to be super good at, okay? I call these the fearsome foursome. I've never actually called them that, but I did in this presentation. <laughs> 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 walking into the clients, you know, it's the, already. <laughs> uh, so they are, basically it breaks down to, are you looking at one variable? Are you looking at, so one variable is a histogram. Are you looking at many different levels in a, a single variable? That's a bar plot. Are you looking at two variables? That's a scatter plot. And are you looking at evolution over time? That's a line plot. Essentially, you're going to get most of your points across with these graphs and the variance of those within. So bar plots can be, you know, horizontal or vertical. They can be stacked. They can be scattered. Histograms can have a density plot, scatter plots can be 3D, line charts can have multiple lines, stacked lines, area, they all fall into these categories. I'll put in a special mention uh, there to three more plots that we use. Uh, they don't fall into the fearsome foursome, they're part of the super seven. Uh, <laughs> uh, the box plot is for comparing distributions. A box plot is a fantastic chart, but I have never walked into a meeting that's not in my own company and not had to spend 10 minutes explaining what this box plot is, never mind what the data represents. So great in, in, kind of in your own office, but don't bring them elsewhere. Sankey diagrams are cool for flow, but they're a bit annoying to make. And then maps are just brilliant overall because um, everyone understands a map. They look great, they look impressive. You can kind of zoom and stuff and everyone goes, ooh, wow, data visualization. So special mention for those ones. So, as I started to prepare for this talk, and I hadn't given a talk on this topic before, I kind of said, I had an idea in my head, here's how I'm going to do this. And I've done a lot of work visualizing in, in, in Python, but always found it a little bit annoying. Okay, so if anyone's worked in OR, or as a statistical language, OR has like one like really good data visualization library called ggplot. And like it's the library for visualizations. So if you're in OR, you get your data, you open up ggplot, and you start hammering through graphics. And once you've learned ggplot, you're really good at visualization. They look nice, they're quick to use. It's, it's a very good library. There's nothing really that uniform in Python. So the good news is there's loads of choice, and the bad news is there's loads of choice. So because of so many libraries, they all kind of are really good and really bad in different ways. So we'll go through some of them now. And the task quickly becomes, what are you going to use and how are you going to use it? And I'm trying to get across here about what you should try and choose. And I think it's best to kind of conquer. You can probably get away with conquering kind of two libraries and you'll have a, a good tool set. Um, so to start, for the people who are probably maybe new to data science, to give them kind of a background, um, there's probably three main components of a data scientist's workflow. One is they're going to have an interactive environment where they can iteratively interact with their data in real time. You're going to use a library, not just core Python, to manipulate your data. So things like grouping by variables, um, spitting it out, merging columns together, just simple stuff. Um, and then the visualization library is on top of that. The tools of choice um, in this presentation and in my own work would be a, a Jupyter Lab notebook for um, the interactive kind of environment. Uh, the Pandas library for data frame management and manipulation. And then a visualization library is, you'll have to wait for 20 slides. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you what that looks like. So I think, I forget sometimes that some people are, um, come with this from blank. So it's like, why would you use a Jupyter notebook? And some people are saying, this is obvious, but other people are saying, oh, I don't know. Um, a Jupyter notebook looks like this. You open it up, you're able to iteratively change our you're interactively change this code as you go. So you can add code, bits and pieces. So here I have a lot of imports, as you would at the top of a program. And you just control enter to run the cell, right? 
Pandas is a library for data manipulation. It's a very short background. So this Pandas is normally imported as PD. Just, that's the notation. Uh, it gives you tools for like reading CSV. So in this cell here, I am reading a CSV called chat performance clean two, and I'm parsing the column start time for date. So when I run that, that is now loaded into my environment. And now I can interact with that. And this is the level you need to get to when you're doing data science work. This is what you'll do. You'll get data from a, a client and you'll go, okay, what's in there? And you'll run that and you'll say, oh, okay, that's okay. Actually, do you know what? Show me kind of, um, show me instead, show me 10 columns and you'll need to go ahead 10. And you'll be interactively going through. You say, okay, I see I've got chats here per line and I've got, you know, um, user IDs there, and I've got languages. I wonder how many languages there are. And then you need to get to, you know, data, language, value counts, right? You're like, oh, very good. There's English, Italian, French. And then you might say, oh, let's show me a visualization of that. And then you'll be hammering in this, and you might just go dot plot. Kind equals bar. And you're like, oh, that's handy. So now I can see that English is by far the predominant language in my chat data here. And then you might do the same for users. And you might say, oh, well, I wonder, actually, that's interesting. The, what else is in here? You know, the handling time. Oh, I wonder what that looks like. And you might work out the mean, you might work out the median. But the easiest thing to do there is work out the handling time, do a plot, and just do a histogram. And you get a histogram and you say, oh, that's not actually that good. You know what? I want to see that in more detail. And now I see the histograms. You can see, oh, chats end about 800 seconds. The longest one's about 7,000 seconds. That kind of iterative process where you know a graphing tool well enough not to think about how to make the graphs, but just to answer the questions. That's where you need to, to get to when you're doing that kind of data science work. So in this kind of graphing ecostructure, there's one big library that kind of dominates um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the blog posts and a lot of the work, and that's called Matplotlib. Matplotlib is like the granddaddy of all, of all uh, visualization libraries in Python. It's been around since 2003. Uh, it had a release, like there's you know, bug fixes constantly. It was, it was a new release last week, I think. Um, it's very, very flexible. It starts at the very, very basic level down to like put a square on a sheet, put an axis on the left, put dashes on that axis to you know, tell me where one, two, three is really low level stuff, right up to higher level abstractions on that to create a bar chart, create a line chart, all that sort of things. So very, very flexible. If you can think of some mad visualization that no one's ever thought of, you can probably implement it in Matplotlib. Um, but as a result, that ends up with quite verbose code. Um, at times you can think it's aesthetically lacking and it's kind of difficult to work with in pandas sometimes. So we'll go through some, uh, some ideas for that. Um, but it has loads of functionality. Think of it like as a tractor with a trailer of tools behind it. You will find your way to do whatever you want with Matplotlib. <coughs> then there's other libraries then that are built on top of Matplotlib and completely separate. So the ones that you're gonna come across with and the ones we're gonna discuss today are Pandas, which is the data manipulation library that I use there to do the head and group buys and all those kind of things. That has a visualization API built in, which is essentially a thin wrapper on top of Matplotlib. So it produces Matplotlib graphs but with maybe a nicer API. And that's actually what I use there to make those quick graphs. Seaborn is kind of, so Matplotlib is like a plastic car cover on top of the tractor. Seaborn then is a nicer plastic cover. It still creates like, it still creates Matplotlib graphs, but they're nicer looking. And the API is a bit nicer too. So it's like a Ferrari cover on top of the tractor. Uh, and then Altair, Altair is a completely different library, so it doesn't use Matplotlib at all, so it's completely separate, has a different API, um, and it allows for some interactivity, and it produces a JSON format that can be viewed online. It's like a jet flying by, but it's hard to drive. Um, so we're going to go through Matplotlib, these three, today. Uh, I'm going to show you some example code snippets between them, so you can see kind of the differences. Um, I'm probably going to go through one or two chart styles in kind of detail and show you why some are good, some are bad, and I'll keep it short enough so we have time for questions. So you saw at the thing there at the start, I had a lot of imports. So they're kind of standard. Um, in the Jupyter Notebook, you're always going to have at the top a lot of imports to get yourself set up. Um, this is probably for reference, really. 
the kind of standards are to import pandas as PD, NumPy as NP, Matplotlib, MPL. Uh, Seaborn is actually a library that's imported as SNS. Apparently the author, um, the author was a big fan of the West Wing and named it after Sam Norman Seaborn. So you know, it just got into the code then. Uh, so he imports that as SNS, Altair is Alt, and then there's a few little setup things. So for those graphs to appear in line, you run what's called an, a, a Jupyter Notebook magic called Matplotlib in line, and you can set your default figure size. So in all your data analysis projects, you'll start off with a big load of imports like that. For this example today, we're going to talk through um, a semi-real data set. It's the kind of data set we would receive at edge tier. Um, it's kind of anonymized random data, but it's um, each entry in the data set is a chat that happened between an agent and a customer. Each one has a number of messages, has a start time when the chat happened, and a total handling time. So how many seconds it took for the agent to process that chat. And that comes from, I think, six different, uh, 10 different websites in this column, six in this where the smallest ones are just set as other. Um, and it's across, I think, seven languages, but most of them are English, as you saw. And this is the, the data set we're going to use here just for, for visualization. So it's worth uh, knowing what's in there. So 5,477 chats with 100 different agents. The first plot we're going to look at is the bar plot. Um, so the plot we're going to do is look at number of chats per user. Okay, so chats per user should be simple enough. How many individual rows in that data set are there per user in the data set as well? So that's like a very quick question that you should be able to answer uh, quite fast from your data. The first thing we're going to do is, and there's argument, I suppose, here. Um, and this is where you'll see differences in the libraries almost immediately. The, the ethos of any visualization library can be, OK, I need to make a graph. I get my raw data. I transform it in to create a chats per user data frame. And then I visualize that data frame, right? So I've done all this mathematical work to find the answer of what I want to visualize. And that's data manipulation, then graph. And the other process is, and ggplot2 and Aura would follow this, is like using a grammar of graphics. So you give the graphics library the entire data set, and you tell it, group by this and bar plot that. And it does the manipulation. Okay, So two different schools of thought there, and you'll see that between the libraries. In this case, for matplotlib, as you can imagine, it's quite a low-level library. We are doing the manipulation ourselves. Now, Pandas is really good at this. So once you've got your data into Pandas, yeah, the bad news is, I suppose, you need to learn loads of Pandas as well. So you need to be quite good at manipulating data in Pandas. So to find out chats per user, we're doing a simple group by user ID, finding the count, renaming the columns in the second line, and in the third line, sorting by the number of chats. All right? And I end up with, on the bottom left there, that by 5,000 user IDs, 100 user IDs. So user ID 1395 had 406 chats over our data set period. So you can imagine this is just a two column data set and that's what we're going to use to visualize. So very simple ish matplotlib to make a plot. And in all of these plots, I've added an X axis, a Y axis and a title because only a lunatic would make a plot without an X axis, a Y axis and a title. Uh, but that does add some code complexity and maybe it's not fair to compare all the code libraries in the same way. So the actual visualization piece of this is only the first three lines. Now, in this case, I had to manually take, here's the top n. I had to manually say, put them at these points on x, so 1 to 20, essentially, or 0 to 20, and give them the height of each bar. So I'm making a bar chart. Here's the x positions. Here's the heights. And I'm only giving the first 20. That produces the graph. And then I add the x ticks. So I'm adding the, the numbers down the bottom to, to specify the users. And then I'm putting on x label, y label, and putting on some nice little dashes. So that's short but also a, a little bit long, if you, like it's six or seven lines. But if you're doing that quickly and iteratively, it, it, it's quickly becoming uh, a bit of a pain. Uh, the dot bar function does the work, uh, but you have to manually position the X labels. That's the problem. In pandas, it's one line. So it's one line at the top. So you do chats per user. You limit out the 0 to 20 immediately just with an index, and you just do dot plot. Put user ID on the, on the X, number of chats on the Y, make it a bar chart and do other things. So you can see they've created almost the same chart, but, but they've provided a wrapper to the plot function in matplotlib. I'm, I'm sorry, a wrapper to the bar function. But it is the same plot, essentially. And because it's a matplotlib plot, 
we use these same commands plot.xlabel, plot.ylabel. So a little bit better, but um, you to use the pandas libraries and plotting, you kind of need to know the matplotlib functions to do the manipulation afterwards. Uh, so Seaborn, and I'll, I'll get through to all the points here. Seaborn is faster again. One line up the top. Again, it creates a matplotlib output. So you can see that I still use plot.xtix, plot.ylabel, plot.xlabel, same stuff here, but it looks a bit nicer. It's kind of got a gray background. It's got nice salmon color. You know, it's, it's just a bit less brash. Um, and then finally, Altair. So Altair is arriving in the jet and it's saying, I don't do, I don't do matplotlib. I've got a completely different way of doing things. Uh, again, kind of nice. Uh, you just create a chart. You put in the data here, the title. You say it's a bar chart here, mark bar. Sorry, is that me? Mark bar. And then you um, put in the x-axis, the y-axis, and away you go. The only bit of complicated code here was actually the um, yeah, sorting the bar. It took, me, it took me ages to see where I have on the fifth line there, sort equals encoding sort field. Massively unintuitive way to sort the bars in your bar chart. But once you know it, it's kind of easy to do. Uh, so I'm just going to... Okay. Um, one important thing about Altair is it's quite different. The, the plot comes out in a JSON format. So what's actually happening there is that a JSON format is being generated, and it's using what's called the Vega Lite library behind the scenes to generate your graph. So you can actually open that in a web browser in the Vega Lite website, paste in that JavaScript, and the exact same... Or sorry, paste in that JSON, and the exact same chart appears. So it's got a portable format, which is good and bad. An issue with that, though, is that the entire data set is also encoded in that JSON. So you can see the data starts there on the uh, bottom right, and that has 100 rows. So if you're plotting something with 600,000 rows, this file quickly becomes very large, and you're saving that to your Jupyter Notebook, and then it gets all a bit out of hand. So you have to be a little bit careful with Altair. So there's our four commands. Um, I would say this is the simplest type of plot you can do. It's just like group by plot category. All of them the same but different. The first three with the matplotlib style, dot plot, put an X and a Y, and I'll tear a little different. So you can cheat a little bit. You can take the pandas library, import Seaborn type set, and then suddenly all your pandas charts look like Seaborn charts, and you're getting kind of pretty pandas charts at the expense of um, Seaborn, but you're still using the, the pandas API, which is a little bit easier. So you're still, you just type sns.set, and then this is the same pandas code, but it applies a nicer, colorful, kind of pretty style if you want to print it. So what I wanted to do then is make a more challenging bar plot, right? So that was quite simple, uh, and just going to show some of the weaknesses. So I'm going to not go through the code here, but what I'm doing here is manipulating the data set such that I'm getting the, for the top 20 users, how many chats did each user have on each website? So there's six websites, one A, B, C, D, E, and other. And for each one of those, I want to know how many chats each user had. So there's a bit of pandas manipulation on the left. Um, find out the top five websites, find out the chats per user on those, and sort it. And I end up with a user ID, a website, a number of chats, and a total chats. So this is the one we're plotting. And I wanted to put this on a stacked bar chart. So a stacked bar chart looks like this. Um, where each user is a bar, and I want to see, are some users working on some websites and other users working on other websites? That's roughly what I'm trying to work out here. And very quickly, matplotlib becomes an absolute pain for this. So to do this, this much code was, the plot on the left was generated with the code on the right. So you have to create a for loop that goes through each, um, each website, plot the bars along the bottom, remember the height of those bars, and then plot the next bars on top of those bars, and do that five times. So immediately this breaks the idea that you can quickly go from idea to plot. If you have to do this much work for a plot, stop. Okay? So that leads to just angry frustration, <laughs> bad times, right? So matplotlib, actually after this example, when I wrote it, I said, that's actually the last matplotlib example I'm going to do in this. So as you get more complex, matplotlib, just don't use it. Uh, fine for a quick one, but not for uh, a long one. So, stack bars and pandas are a lot easier. Pandas subscribes to the idea that you do the data manipulation outside of the plotting. So, our idea number one. And that's probably because it's a really good data manipulation library. 
So to create the bar chart itself is actually really, really easy. It's just this line here, plot data dot plot, kind equals bar, stacked equals true, which is a lot better than our matplotlib cousin. Uh, however, I had to do a little bit of manipulation first to go from long format, which is like user ID, website, number of chats, to wide format, where the user ID is on the, the, the column or axis. Essentially, if you're plotting anything with multiple lines in pandas, you just need to remember that the x-axis goes in your index here on the left, and each line or bar appears across the top. So once you've got it in that format, it's just dot plot. So simple code to plot, maybe you need to remember all the data manipulation, which is okay, but it means you're probably making extra data sets just to do the manipulation, not passing it in. Seaborn, really nice API. Uh, bar plot, X, Y, color, go except it doesn't give you a stacked bar chart, it gives you a, what's called a jittered bar chart or a side-by-side. -side. So you can see these should be on top of each other, but they're not. There is no stacked equals true option here, and there is no way to make a stacked bar chart in Seaborn unless you do it the matplotlib way. And there's one blog post out there that does it. The author of the Seaborn library, while he likes the West Wing, does not like stacked bar charts. <laughs> and, and actually, just, he says this in, his, in the comments, there's loads of people saying, like, can we add a stacked bar charts? And he just goes, no, we can't. And then someone went and added stacked bar charts and submitted the PR working, and he just said, rejected. Stacked bar charts are bad. <laughs> <laughs> so Seaborn, so beautiful library, really nice. I would use it for loads of things, but you need to just know the limitations, OK? Altair, different API. Simple, didn't need to do the data manipulation beforehand, just use our chats per user. And then this kind of looks more confusing than it is. You just basically make the X here, make the Y here. The sorting again was a pain, but I liked this. Um, I hadn't used Altair before this talk. I will definitely be using it more in the future. Um, it does store the entire graph as JSON, so you do a little bit of setting up to make sure you store that on your hard drive rather than as JSON um, in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and then probably, I suppose it's probably worth adding Seaborn while we're smashing the computer here. Seaborn does do this a little bit nicer, nicer as well. So if you look at here, here I'm making this bar plot here, but not from my chats per user data set, but from the raw data at the start, so the entire data set. So these are really subscribing to the grammar of graphics methodology where I say, give me the entire data set, put X, use ready on the x-axis, handling time on the y-axis, and give me the mean handling time per user ID. And in those, that one line or one execution, that graph appears. And that's obviously, the calculations are being done as part of the plotting, so it doesn't appear instantly, but it appears within, I'd say, half a second. Um, and it separates out then your data from your visualization code, and you're not creating all these temporary things. So that's a very nice functionality. And it also means if I make that plot, if I just change the word mean there to sum, my plot is then the total handling time for each agent. And that means you can iterate very, very quickly. I don't need to create these extra data sets. So uh, Altair does the same thing. So Altair and Seaborn both subscribe to the grammar of graphics type methodology. So bar charts are the ones I'm going to go through in a good bit of detail. Uh, I'll go through faster through the other ones. Histograms, brilliant visualizations. Everyone understands them or should. There's a little bit of explanation sometimes. Uh, all the libraries are really good at this. Um, it's like all the libraries came together and said, if there's one chart we're going to be good at, histograms are it. Uh, your pandas is just one line. It's data handling time dot hist. Your seaborn is just seaborn dot dist plot, distribution plot, and you plot that. And then Altair is the same thing. So it's a dot mark bar, and you write bin on it. Um, comparing them like that probably isn't that fair. Comparing them like this is probably fairer. So without adding the titles, and in fairness, you're only going to add titles when you're actually putting into a report or a presentation. So when you're actually working in your Jupyter Notebook and banging through charts as quick as you can, you're not going to bother. This is the one-liners you're going to be writing to get those visualizations. So on the left is Pandas, Seaborn, and Altair. Altair is a little bit longer here, and I tend to favor Pandas for this kind of stuff because it's kind of built in to, I already have the data in Pandas. I can select columns very easily and just type dot .plot or dot .hist, and it's, it's a way and a hack. Um, you can do layering by, unfortunately, a bit matplotlib-esque, but you need to just do each layer on time. So this is for user ID 1391 and then 1358, and they appear nicely overlapped. Um, and then Seaborn as well has a nice uh, 
Seaborn probably subscribes, it's much more statistical, so it allows you to do things like density plots. Density plots are lovely. They put nice curves on things and they look very fancy. They're not that interpretable. What does 0.008 mean for the peak there? How many chats is that? Is that a percent? Is it not a percent? What's the... It looks cool, but it's maybe not um, as interpretable. However, the Seaborn API is quite flexible and there's a lot more options in there to look at. Um, for the scatter plots, pandas. Pandas is messy. Uh, if you've got one, if you've got two variables you want to plot them against each other, so x and y, grand, scatter plot pops out. If you want to do two plots, two, two variables, but color the plots by some other variable. So in this case, I want to plot handling time and then the, um, the messages in each chat. So how many messages are in each chat? What's the handling time of the chat? You expect a positive correlation. And then I want to color by website to see if different websites are having longer chats or shorter chats. But for pandas, you have to manually say, OK, website A, color red, website B, color blue, website C, color green. So you need to know every category that's in your uh, data that you're plotting. And again, if you're writing that code, that quickly becomes a kind of get the computer off the desk situation, move to something else. So Seaborn provides a much nicer API for that, where it's just give me handling time of the X, messages on the Y, color by website. Plot me that, please. And again, you're just passing in the raw data there, so no data manipulation at all and no knowledge. I don't need to know. There could be 15 websites in the website summary column, and it'll find colors for them all. So that's always very nice. Um, Altair, similar thing. So again, it does the data. So give it an X, give it a Y, give it a color, go. Interesting then, as, a, as an example, um, the Altair library then gives an interactive option. So if I type in interactive, let's watch the time here now as well. Yep, so if I'm on interactive mode in here, so that then actually makes an interactive plot in my library here. So I can zoom here and say, like, oh, that's interesting, around, oh, sorry, in there around handling time of 3,000 seconds, what are these ones here? Oh, they're user ID, blah. So you can plot things and explore them and do that interactively. And then you can further open those or save them as, as whatever. So it's an interactive kind of uh, plot, which is a nice, a nice thing to have. Um, and then finally, our line plots. Line plots, use them for visualization over time. Don't use a bar for visualizing things over time, because bars are for length and comparisons. So this, I want to look at the language distribution over time. So per day, what chats in what language? I want to line per language. And now you're starting to see the patterns. So a bit of manipulation at the start to work out uh, date, language, number of chats. And then pandas requires a little bit more manipulation. So change that into from long format to wide format. So here I have, again, x-axis is the index. All the lines are along the top. It's simple to do, but you need to remember to do it. So it's a plot pivot in pandas. And then it's from there, it's really simple. It's just pandas plot dot plot. Or sorry, it's the data dot plot kind equals line. Job done. Now, this actual data set didn't have any languages until the last four or five days. But you can see how quick it goes from the data to the plot, but pandas requires you to get the data into their exact format for that to happen. Um, Seaborn, obviously, then, in aligned with all the other patterns, and this pattern then continues. This is what I kind of want to get across here. Seaborn and Altair work on the raw data, and they say, like, you know, give me date on the X, chat ID on the Y as a count, and then um, color by language, and the estimator is length. So length is like the count, and that just pops out straight away and the same thing for Altair. So why? Here, you actually provide the APIs slightly different. You provide a count function to it, and it does the counting of charities per date. So very, very quick to make the, the things. So there are four, fearsome foursome. Uh, overall, the patterns are pandas requires more manipulation, but it's very good at it. Matplotlib is good for just the most basic, but it's difficult once you go further. Uh, and Seaborn and Altair subscribe more to the grammar of graphics. And then Altair provides a little bit more interaction. So you need to kind of know where you're going. Uh, I'll conclude at the end. If you're into geospatial stuff, two libraries to look into. Matplotlib has a base map library. Maps are great. Give someone a colored map of a, an area with the areas colored. They'll find their home. They'll think it's great. Massively overweights larger areas, not populations. So you need to be a little bit careful. But as a way of conveying information, putting points on a map and coloring areas is, is, is really nice. And then there's two other libraries, uh, Boca and Plotly, which are excellent for um, 
very interactive diagrams. So I would describe them as, uh, they're not really, I don't find them as good for that kind of interaction, really quick iteration of diagrams. But if you want to create a publication ready interactive diagram that you can send to someone, it's, um, they're, they're very, very good. Uh, so for example, this kind of thing is Boca, so you can create this output from your Python library. It gives you know the ability to actually change things on the. Let me just refresh that. You can like make the graph here in real time, and it's plotting different things. So it's almost like um, I don't know how it's come across the or shiny library. You can add tooltips. Very interactive, really nice, but a good bit of code to to make that happen. Plotly, it's probably less code, but uh, still good. So you've got interaction here on hovers on zooms, so you can zoom in and zoom out and all this kind of thing. So very, very uh, more interactive, but maybe not as good for the kind of straight data exploration tasks. So the last thing I wanted to finish on then was just things to avoid. As you go on your, on your data visualization journey, there's a few things maybe I'll highlight to avoid. One is pie charts, um, and not pie charts per se, but getting people to compare things based on angle. So humans have evolved really, really well to survive in the wild and see what's close and what's far away and what's big and what's small. So if I was to ask you there on that pie chart, you know, um, tell me like how much more do people like giraffes than tigers or tigers than giraffes without looking at the actual percentages written in. If you're making a visualization where you have to write the percentages, you've kind of failed in your visualization task. It should be clearer from the actual so you can see how much faster you can compare those lengths versus comparing those angles. The same thing is to area. So same thing, humans, batted area. If I said to you, how much smaller is D than E? Is it twice, three times, four times? And what's the size comparison between B and E? Is it like kind of the same, 20%, 10%? And then if I gave you that in a bar, it's immediately visible, the comparison between the different things. So you're, you're really good at looking at distances. You are not good at looking at angles or area. Maybe one of you is, but <laughs> most of you aren't. Um, and then 3D. If you're even tempted to press the 3D button, <laughs> just slap your hand back into your pocket. I actually wish I had the animation of the guy smashed the computer. But 3D is just confounding graphics for fake fancy. It's making things look nice. But it's probably on the left, hiding bars that can't be seen, or on the right, further distorting and already difficult to interpret chart. Um, so both of those charts there actually can found 3D and too many categories. So um, just watch those. The only caveat I would say there, and I will let people away with and have used, um, 3D scatter plots. These are actually the one time when 3D kind of makes sense. So in this case here, we're good at interpreting 3D when it's moving. So you can see here, this is locations of earthquakes. And you can see there's not really any much of a pattern there, and it's very hard to see. But as soon as I start to move that, the patterns become clear. So when I move that like that, you can see very quickly your eyes work out, oh, there's a gap there, and here's the gaps, and here's the spots. But when I stop, as soon as I stop and make it a static plot again, you just quickly lose those kind of depths. So uh, 3D interactive scatters are uh, the, the, the type of 3D that you want to be in, but not 3D pie charts. Um, so I'm going to conclude. That's my talk. Um, so hopefully, takeaway is wide variety of tools available. All of them are good but some of them are better than others at certain things. You won't probably get away with knowing just one, or you will be limited if you just know one. Um, I would advise getting familiar with the Panda syntax. It's a good wrapper on uh, the Matplotlib API. It provides the basic plot types very quickly. Cheat and use Seaborn uh, for just the styles. You can go like set style, whatever, and it'll make your plots look really nice. And then maybe learn one other high-level API just for uh, pick between Seaborn or Altair or Plotly just so you can make kind of publication or interactive graphs, but leave that till the end. You'll get by all the way almost with the, the Panda stuff. Um, and in all of your visualization attempts, I would say that simplicity is, well, Leonardo da Vinci would say, that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So if you find yourself using more than five colors, if you find yourself with a complicated graph, trying to get multiple points across, just distill it down to what's the point of this graph, what am I trying to show, and show it in the most simple way possible, and that'll, uh, that'll do you well. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, we time for questions. Or are we? Yeah. yeah, we have a few minutes. So if there's any questions, please feel free to shoot. You give a lot of presentations. How do you get the graphs into the presentation? So that uh, I do the classic uh, shift command control.
copy paste task in thing. So I go like this. And then I just hammer it in. So I think that <laughs> <laughs> so it's built into Mac. It's a, the screen clipper in Windows do the same thing. So but I have to, if you're doing that, zoom, zoom in a lot on the, uh, the graph to get the resolution higher. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem. You, gotta, you have to have your scale exactly right. Yes, and a big screen. And then paste it in the Yeah, it's a bit crap, actually. If you're using uh, any of the pandas or Python libraries, you can get them to export directly to SVG and PNG format, and then paste those in at the GPI that you want to achieve. So for my thesis and PhD, that was exporting EPS files with vector format yeah. and then putting those straight into the document. But there is no good way to turn it into. <laughs> so you use bitmaps, you don't try to put vector For this kind of presentation, I would, this was, it was 1 a.m. last night. So. <laughs> but I think there, there is an output for um, vector-based format from, from the part that I was saying. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. I have to leave my turn for the next talk now. So. Okay. Thanks Thank very much, much for your attention.